Okay, so welcome to the panel session. As you have heard of GCGC, we have 12 academic papers, and we like to have two panels. So last year we had a panel on voting choice uh, with BlackRock uh, and with Luigi Zingales. I arranged that panel and had COVID. Uh, this year I don't have COVID. Uh, and we have a great panel here um, with uh, me. Um, three out of the uh, five largest uh, pension funds in the world. Now, why have we tried to put this panel together? And I'll introduce the panelists in a second. Um, if you, we already heard today about uh, the stewardship agency model. As other uh, colleagues have emphasized, we actually have a double agency issue. Uh, there's first of all the agency issue between the beneficiaries of the pension fund and the trustees. And then there's also the agency issue between the pension funds and the asset managers. Now we, as a group of scholars, uh, in, certainly in GCGC conferences in the past, we have very much focused on asset managers, on the black box, vanguards, and state streets, and others of the world. We have blissfully uh, overseen the uh, elephants in the room. Uh, that is, and I'm apo I apologize already for comparing you to elephants, um, the large people that are, should be more visible, which is the largest pension fund in the world. So many of you will know that uh, GPIF, uh, the uh, government pension fund of uh, Japan, is the largest in the world. They are larger than Norges. Now, Norges is actually not Norges. It's the Norwegian uh, public fund global managed by NBIM, so that's the asset manager. Uh, and the third largest fund is NPS, who are also here today. And then the fifth largest uh, pension fund is ABP, that's the pension fund. Now, the asset manager is actually called AGP, AMPG, okay, so, okay. <laughs> Um, and they are actually owned by the pension fund, as you'll hear in a minute. Now, um, the purpose of this roundtable or this panel tonight is really quite simple, is to learn more about what these pension funds are doing in the stewardship space. And I hope that you'll all be very stimulated by this to hear just how different they go about the topics that we've been discussing today and will discuss again tomorrow, and that you will uh, find it so stimulating that we'll have lots of more papers as we go forward with GCGC. So without further introduction, I will just uh, now turn to introducing our panelists. Um, so I'll go, if you don't mind, by order of fund. So we first of all have Shimura-san from GPIF. Now, Shimura-san is responsible for GPIF's uh, stewardship program, and he's going to present it in a second. And he brought with him uh, Mina-san, uh, who is a member of his team, uh, and who's also going to help us uh, discover what GPIF does. Um, then we have uh, Mr. Lee, uh, who is with um, NPS, and he is actually a new member of the stewardship committee of NPS, and I think he's going to explain what his role with NPS is. And then we have um, Ms. Park, who is with, I'm not getting to get it right, with APG, so the asset manager of the Dutch fund. Uh, she is Korean, and she engages regularly in Korea and other countries of the um, um, region. Um, and uh, we will start with uh, Shimura-san. Thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to learning more about GPIO. I would like to thank Professor Dubek uh, for inviting me to participate in such a wonderful panel. <coughs> Today, I will give a presentation with my students, Mina, before the panel. I would like to briefly introduce uh, GPIF and why we are conducting activities that focus on CSD and then present our recent efforts related to ESG and search activity. <laughs> Before moving to the outline about GPIF, I would like to quickly introduce Japan's public pension system. 
Japan's public pension system is based on the so-called pay-as-you-go system, in which the uh, premium paid by the working generation are used to provide the pension to the elder at that time. However, in Japan's case, birth rate is decreased, decreased and the population is aging rapidly. To prevent the burden of the future working generation from becoming too large, Japan's adapted system, where a portion of pension premium is set aside and reserved as a buffer for the future pension payments. GPF goal is to manage the invest pension reserve to increase the social, social pension benefit and contribute to the stability of the national pension system for the next 100 years. This slide shows the investment performance since 2001. When GPF starts investing in the market, the annual rate of investment return is 3.38% and the accumulated earnings are nearly 100 trillion yen, or about 700 billion US dollars. In other words, within GPF, 200 trillion yen of assets under management, about the half of the current pension reserve come from investment returns. 200 trillion yen of reserve is already one of the largest asset management and the asset under management in the world. But it is but it is expected to accumulate more in the future. Based on the economic assumptions used in DPS portfolio construction, pension reserve in the most average scenario is expect to accumulate four, uh, 479 trillion yen, or about 3.4 trillion US dollar in fiscal uh, 2079. The mission of GPX is to continue to manage pension reserve for the next 100 years. So we are literally a super long term investor. It is reasonable for the consider ESG risks such as climate change, which are uh, likely to manage and materialize and become more serious in the long term. In addition, GPF assets under management are currently extremely large at about 1.4 trillion US dollars. Therefore, it is <coughs> unrealistic to operate in style that accum accumulate alpha in active management. GPF invests in about 6,000 stocks and about 15,000 bonds around the world, mainly by index-based passive investment. In order to capture the growth of economic activity as an investment return. In other words, GPF is universal owner that incorporates the world capital market into its portfolio. Therefore, it is extremely important to pursue sustainable investment return by minimizing the negative impact of each element of ESG. As mentioned in the previous slide, GPF is universal owner and super long term investor. So we conduct investments focusing on ESG. Our investment principle also clearly states the incorporate of ESG factor into the investment process. I would like to highlight number four, investment principle. It is clear state that consideration of ESG is not for the purpose of solving social issue, but for the economic benefit of the pension beneficiaries. Because of the extremely important importance of pension reserve and enormous amount of the fund, very strict restrictions are imposed to our management. One, we are not allowed to consider issue except for those that benefit of pension beneficiaries by GPI growth. Example. To use pension reserve to support specific political party in time of an election is prohibited. For this reason, impact investment that pursues social impact is also prohibited. The 
other is that stock will be managed based on the discretionary investment manage, uh, management agreement. This is a rule to avoid the risk of controlling private companies with public funds. In principle, the law prohibits GPF to instruct external asset managers to buy or divest specific companies. In addition, we, can, we cannot exercise voting rights or give instruction to our external asset manager in proxy voting. Despite these constraints, as a universal owner, super long term investor, GPF has been promoting ESG investment. In particular, I believe that the staffing and ESG index <coughs> for domestic equities in July 2017 had a very large impact. As mentioned before, in-house investment is prohibited for GPI, but by choosing an index, we believe that it is a useful means of showing that we focus on ESG and what we, we focus on ESG investment. Passive investment based on ESG indices was very innovative in a way which requires the index provided to discuss the methodology of the index. By doing so, companies became aware of what, the, what they would need to improve the in, include in the index. And at the same time, EPA has also able to indirect engage and incentivize companies to change their behavior. I would like to take an opportunity to thank the professor who selected this effect and the impact of adapting ESG indices for the analysis. This research done by Professor Yupan, uh, which uh, will be introduced in tomorrow's session. And another research that Professor Beck uh, currently conducted. At present, we use the ESG index released here. The left is the ESG comprehensive index, and the right is the thematic index that focuses on climate change and gender diversity. Including engagement with the external asset managers, DPEF integrates ESG consideration in all assets. The rest shows the annual trend in ESG investing and uh, index-based passive investment and the ESG bond uh, investment. As you can see, the amount of investment is gradually increasing. I would like to introduce an engagement enhancing the passive investment as of another unique initiative. The average view of academia would be that the best cost of action for a manager is to pretend, pretend to engage. Because passive investment <laughs> engagement has a related problem. This engagement enhances the passive investment challenge that view. GPF invests about 50 trillion yen in domestic equity. And, that, and if this engagement enhanced passive investment includes the performance of all domestic stuff by even 0.1%. The effect will be 50 billion yen. We believe that even if we pay an additional engagement fee for the engagement enhanced passive managers, it will be worth to the cost. ESG investments and scholarship activities are ultimately conducted for the purpose of obtaining long-term investment return. But we have to keep in mind that it will, be, it will take a considerable amount of the time before the effects are materialized. For this reason, we believe it is important to follow the PDCA cycle of ESG investment and scholarship activities by monitoring improve, improvement in ESG evaluation and change of behavior by investing companies. We monitor this 
of our annual ESG report. And since 2018, we have also disclosed information about the, on the TCFD recommendation. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Okay. Um, I guess, un unlike uh, what 
uh, previous slide uh, has presented you, you with, unlike GPIS, I guess MPS uh, has a mandate to actually engage uh, directly uh, with the private uh, uh, companies, one to one, uh, with a view to enhance long term uh, stable return. Okay? So I, I think that might be a different approach uh, to GPIS and MPS. And so, uh, prior to the introduction of the stewardship, uh, NPS was only concerned about uh, how to vote on the uh, AGM meeting, uh, okay, how to analyze the audiences that are set, and how to set guidelines on how to vote on, on, on issues on regarding the uh, shareholders' agendas. But after the introduction of Sturge Gold in 2018, uh, I, I think the concept of a, a shareholder rights has broadened into engagement. Okay, so we engage on focused areas and um, uh, area of, of the events that were unprecedented, un unpredicted, and uh, so on a continuing basis. So this special committee on responsible investment governance uh, reviews those issues and decides whether to engage or not. Okay, th this is uh, just the uh, how the actual implementation, uh, the, the, the working people, how they are divided into their functions. One is the responsible investment team and the other is shelter rights team. And this is the milestone. Uh, considering the time of the past. And for major activities, uh, as I said, uh, we engage in responsible invest investment. So the MPF takes into account ESG factors alongside financial factors in the investment decision making process for active business income. This is, this is the diagram and the procedures, how we evaluate ESG factors and how we integrate into uh, investment decision making. Uh, for one thing, uh, all of the ESG evaluation is done in-house, so we do not rely on outside uh, ESG ranges. Okay? I think this consideration was due to the fact that uh, when uh, MPF uh, considered, began considering the ESG uh, investment, uh, there was a concern about the consistency of the ESG ratings and the implication on the investment. So I had the opportunity to consult uh, the responsible investment team regarding this matter. And I had voice that uh, it might not be uh, responsible at this moment to take the uh, ESG rating and and, uh, and take it at face value. Okay, so there, there's this issue of you know what kind what ESG rating companies we we should uh, uh, believe in, so to speak. Uh, so it, it, according to the choice of the ESG uh, rating companies, you know the risk return profile of the portfolio will change. So, you know, you, you can't actually rely on that kind of inconsistency uh, and do a responsible investment, uh, so to speak. So, uh, in that sense, uh, the MPS has decided to keep the, the ESG issue in house and do the evaluation annually. And at this current stage, uh, they don't actually uh, incorporate uh, ESG factors into valuation models. Okay. So they don't forecast cash flow projections or they don't consider uh, the risk profiles into the discount rates. Uh, and at this point, they rely only on negative screening. So if a uh, grade of a company uh, falls to the D uh, grade, uh, then they just limit the weight of the company portfolio uh, to the benchmark. So you are not allowed to go over the weight of the benchmark if uh, the ESG rating is too low. And uh, okay. regarding the exercise of voting rights, uh, uh, the exercise of voting rights is actually done by the uh, investment committee, but on 
matters that they decide to uh, find it difficult to make a decision, they delegate the decision to us, the Special Committee on Responsible and Investment Governance. So whenever uh, an agenda comes to the Special Committee, it's a, it has an issue. So we have to make a vote. Uh, we have a nine member in the committee, so each has its own voices. Uh, and thankfully, it's, it's an odd number, so <laughs> we can come to a conclusion. But whenever a person uh, is missing, uh, you know, it, it's a split decision, uh, then sometimes it, it, uh, it can go over midnight. So, <laughs> so the chairperson of the special committee makes it that makes this desperate effort to make it an odd number so that we can reach a decision on the issue that is considered to be, you know, somewhat tricky. Uh, okay. Uh, this is the uh, voting uh, results during the period of 2020 to 2022. Okay. As I mentioned, we. Uh, usually make a direct uh, voting, uh, but uh, the ones that is not directly managed by the company side that is not directly managed by NPS, which is outsourced, uh, we delegate uh, those decisions outside. So uh, as you can see, uh, most of the uh, results are uh, four years and up, uh, about in 2022, uh, 76 percent was for and 23.35 was against. And more or less the portion of the against uh, between the direct and outsourced or delegated uh, is more or less similar, but uh, you can start see that there's a slice larger portion of opposition uh, votes for the outsourced. Uh, in 2022, uh, 803 items were voted against, and this is uh, the division of the details of the votes against, okay? the largest of which is the compensation limits on directors and auditors, and the second would be, second largest would be appoint, uh, appointment of directors and auditors, okay? and the rest are amendment, uh, uh, amendment to articles of incorporation and other matters. Okay, this is the uh, list of the focus areas uh, that are specifically given uh, to the committee. Okay, so dividend policies, executive compensation limits, violation of laws and regulations, uh, no improvement at the persistent downloading, and climate related risk and industry safety uh, areas are the focus risk. And this focus risk uh, areas are uh, continually monitored by the team. As I mentioned, we team on uh, uh, responsible investment and governance uh, on an annual uh, basis. And after an annual review uh, on during month of July, uh, they will give us the results of their uh, research on the focus areas, and they will give us a limited number of companies that you should look uh, carefully. And then we uh, have this engagement criteria whether we decide to engage them or not. And this is the procedures for engagement. Okay, we start out with the private conversations, we send out our letters and hold interviews, we check facts and ISO corrective measures uh, address concerns. So if that's not working, uh, we monitor this over uh, a period of a year. And after a year, when we decide it's not improved, then we again go into a focus management private. And then after uh, one year's efforts and conversations, and there's no still uh, improvement, uh, we make it a public. Okay? So when MPS makes it a public that a company has a focused issue, then you know, that will have an effect on the company's valuation and market perception. So if that has an incentive for the management to you know, correct uh, or uh, listen back more carefully uh, to our voices. And in the end, when uh, finally there's no still improvement, we uh, engage. Uh, and we have this procedure for active shareholder engagement and file for uh, shareholder resolution, etc. And also, uh, we, we monitor unexpected concerns, unexpected concerns regarding uh, E, S, and G. Okay? I have listed uh, 14 um, uh, issues. 
uh, regarding unexpected concerns, okay, for, for example, for E, climate change, uh, environmental impact management, eco-friendly uh, products. And within this, uh, if, 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 uh, if, if there's a news or if there is a disclosure uh, indicating that the, uh, the company has serious issues with the law enforcement or the government, and when there's a report of some death in this, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a factory, uh, then uh, it is sent to us, okay? Sent individually to the committee members, members and we go with them uh, whether this is going to be a serious matter for the company or not, and decide whether we'll do a material check, okay? And so when we decide that we should uh, uh, do a materiality check, then there's a whole list of you know, standards and measurements that we can decide upon whether this is materially uh, significant or not. And then when we decide it's significant, we engage in private conversation and look for, uh, for, the, uh, for during a period of year. And then after during the period of year, if no improvement, we directly engage in uh, shareholder uh, engagement. And this is the uh, uh, result of shareholder activities last year. 43% uh, of, of the 272 focus area issues and uh, unexpected concerns identified for 139 companies. 43% were ESG unexpected concerns and 27% were regarding different policy. 12 uh, on violation to laws and regulation and compensation and issues and so on. Okay, so this is a brief introduction to uh, what we do. I, I hope you had the understanding of uh, what NTS uh, does regarding uh, ESG considerations and stewardship concerns. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark K. Park. My voice is a bit strange. I got COVID uh, a month ago. I don't have it. <laughs> but my voice is still like very ticklish. I, you know, I don't have germs. So. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna, if, so this is a very good position so that everything, you know, that pension fund, what pension fund has to do, etc. Cetera, is cetera, already well said. So I'm going to skip uh, all of it. I am, so my company APG is uh, as a manager for ABP. What that means is that I have a lot more freedom than, uh, than, than pension funds, right? So I'm gonna just briefly talk about <coughs> my company. So I think most important thing is, let's say we are, we call ourselves as um, responsible investor, not an investor, not just an investor or we don't so that we we don't consider as a uh, you know mainstream investor that incorporates from time to time some of the ESG factors. No, we are supposed to almost hundred percent ESG consideration into uh, investment process. I think we are about ninety nine point nine percent. So that most of the investment committees and most of the investment cases being discussed. ESG is always, let's say, 20% or 30% of the time. So that we, we can actually call uh, ourselves as a um, long-term uh, responsible investor. And the other thing is, um, let's say, so it, it's a responsible investment, invest, I am not going to bore you. I can, I can spend all day talking about what we do and the, what ESG factors, et cetera, et cetera. So roughly speaking, we look at about, so let's say when we, um, analyze Apple, for example. We look at about 200 uh, different ESG factors, and then that forms, let's say, how do we view this company, you know, Apple as a company? How do we view from an E and S and G perspective? So that I think there's a, a pretty robust system is there, and then everybody is looking at it. So, and then that's for every company. So we have about, depending on the FX, <laughs> And depending on the market situation, we have about 550 or 600, uh, 600 uh, billion a year. So let's say 600. We have about a, a, a third 
in the equity market, and then and and, and about a third of fixed income uh, credits and bonds and etc. And then a third about uh, private uh, investment. So that we buy airports, uh, we buy uh, buildings and etc. etc. So that those all of them we each and every investment we we are supposed to actually look at ESG issues. So that's um, a little bit boring, but then <laughs> these are the things that we are actually looking at these days. So that's what it means is in, in the investment committee for investment case studies, for example, we look at, we think about let's say climate is, you know, as a very important factor, as a transition factor. So that if the company is actually ready for it, where they are, et cetera, et cetera, and what are the opportunities and risks, and et cetera, et cetera. So, and then the other thing, the other thing is about digitalization, and then the last one is uh, let's say biodiversity. And then I think precondition is whenever we look at this, you know, transition issues, we should we are not supposed to actually um, we are supposed to look at human rights issues. So, so for example, climate issues, we need to look at human rights issues. No one is left behind. At, at least we are trying to. So that that's that's I think preconditions. These questions always come. And then you might ask, how do you monitor yourself? Then, then this whole SD, you know, SDEI, so that Sustainable Development Investment Goal is coming up. So that every year, we actually measure ourselves against how much SDI is there. So that this is how roughly uh, we do components. So we exclude a lot of companies. We exclude a lot of um, many sectors. So, such as um, some of the human killing um, armament company, companies, or, or do you smoke? Smoking <laughs> companies, yes. <laughs> so, let's all oh, human killing some pharmaceutical companies we exclude as well. So, that we exclude a lot, a lot. Then you might ask, what about the companies you have in your portfolio? As I mentioned, we integrate ESG factors and then look at them. Climate change again is a very important factor, SDI, and then here you go. Uh, engagement and, and, and exercise of uh, shareholders' rights. I spend, I spend most, the, about 60 to 70 percent of my time engaging with the companies, engaging with the companies, engaging with the policy makers, engaging with the you know fellow peer um, investors. So that that's my uh, time. And then sometimes we look at, let's say, collaboration and standard setting. So this is when we actually look at, this whole slide actually wasn't for this one. I wasn't going to uh, use this one. But later, at the, earlier this week, I was, um, I, I participated in the seminar organized by, so let's say, National Assembly. So the National Assembly, so that I, behind the curtain, lobby, uh, so that, you know, the shareholder rights enhancement kind of clause and amendment is, is actually possible. So that those things what I do behind the curtain. So what rights do I have? I mean practically speaking. So that I actually left out to suing the company and legislature, etc. Et I mean that's not going to happen that often. So that for example, let's say you know we vote on the agenda at shareholders meeting. But if you think about, so let's say, for, for example, you can think, I put it Korea, right? You can actually think that Korea and Japan, because Korea and Japan, are, uh, those are my markets, and actually challenges are similar, and settings are very, very similar. But agenda is, so the voting at the meeting, it's with 0.5% stake or 1% stake even, uh, it wouldn't change the big picture. We can't, so that we basically cannot really uh, exercise good impact. So that we, so that the, the problem is agenda is actually limited, and then so without let's say voting, whether the vote is passed or not passed, actually at the AGM there is no, there is no, so that we can't stop the company's day-to-day -day operation. So no one cares. So that that's that's a thing. And then show the meeting in Korea and Japan, in my view, it's, a, it's just a formality. So, okay, we vote agenda, but not much impact. 
Then I started actually going to Shaolin's meeting, attend the Shaolin's meeting. As soon as I actually did it, whoa, 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 companies were saying, what, you're going to come to ATM? What, are you going to ask questions, etc., etc.? So most of the time, even today, I am the only investor. So that I'm talking about the actual, so this time I went to LG Chemical. Do you, you know LG Chemical, right? It's a white goods maker. You par perhaps have some of the white goods that you have. Um, I went there. So that the auditorium room is about 500 people capacity, or maybe 500 to 700. Um, there were about seven people, seven non-employee people. <laughs> I was the only investor. So then basically, if when investors don't come to the, the AGM, what would companies do? So that the AGM lasted 10 minutes. So the basically, ooh, agenda one, agenda two, agenda three, okay, all done. On the podium, right, there was only one person, uh, two, two people. One is lawyer. The other person was chair. So that sitting, so that you don't have, let's say, board, um, the board members sitting and then trying to explain to the da, da, da. None of that happened. Edge Chemical is not a small company. This is the biggest chemical company, perhaps globally market, number one market share or something for, for uh, white goods, but this happened. So, I mean, it's like that. Then what do you do? I mean, I, when other shareholders, investors don't come, my voice is actually very small. So the one I started doing is a submit shareholder proposal. So that um, it's, uh, it, it changed a little bit, but I think that I'm hoping that um, Here's what, commercial shareholders, commercial asset managers, let's say BlackRock, Fidelity, or those guys, you can't expect them to fight with the companies. It's, that's just unfair, because there are a lot of commercial reality there, and et cetera, et cetera. So, but then we are not commercial organization. So what I am trying to do is, these are both agenda, attention to those meetings, Submit shareholder proposal. It is this one. These are the things that are written in the commercial law. So maybe as well just try. So if I try, then there might be some other shareholders might try as well. So that I think uh, very happily, uh, number of the investors who are submitting shareholder proposal has been on the rise. So I think that's a good um, positive impact that we are making. So two slides left. <laughs> so I think um, just I'm gonna just pause. These are the top engagement cases that I have been doing in Korea. You might want to have a just read. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the first one that I, that I remember about 13 years ago when I first the first first engagement activities I had done was against Samsung Electronics. And then I raised um, leukemia cancer case for the first time in the in the co Samsung's corporate history. And my mom and dad was, is this you? Are you nuts? <laughs> All my friends were like, do you want to die or something? So I told my mom and dad, mom and dad, just make sure that you pay tax. <laughs> so the, since then, uh, let's say shipping industry, for example, 130 people died. And then I, I really wanted to do something by engaging. So that um, let's spend a lot of time. So Hyundai Motor, for example, when the company actually started selling lots of cars, so cash come, coming in and etc. So I was thinking that, OK, now you made money, so dividend will go up. No, instead, they went ahead, and then they bought. They spent about, what, $2 billion? Is it $2 billion? No, two billion, two billion US dollar, and then buy a you know, pot of land. And CFO actually came to, to see me and then saying that, let's say, what is the problem, Mr. So I said, to CFO, uh, Mr. Lee, do you know your dividend payout ratio? His last year and then the historically. He, surprisingly, he didn't know dividend payout ratio. It's 6%. 
Mr. Lee. And then you put a piece of land. That money is supposed to be mine. <laughs> so I think that, so that something like this this just happened. Recently, what I did was, um, let's say, the latest one was, uh, uh, latest, latest one was uh, Hyundai Development, so number 11, series of fat fatal accidents. So how many people died? 16 people died in seven months' time. So the, what I did was I, uh, uh, APG basically filed a shareholder proposal so that the company should pay attention on, let's say, safety management and et cetera, et cetera. Since then, no one died yet. So it's, uh, hopefully that will continue. And then uh, last year, there was another um, uh, shareholder proposal we filed. Number, number 12, I'm talking about, KT. Uh, company has been sitting on a large amount of treasury shares. They didn't cancel. Uh, did, they didn't cancel over the past, let's say, 10 something years. And then they, instead of actually canceling them, they created cross shareholding structures, which is very bad for us. So then uh, we filed the shareholder proposal. This year, APG, um, we filed the shareholder proposal. <laughs> we filed the shareholder proposal against Toyota Motor because in one hand, I mean, Toyota is a great company. I really admire and I really uh, respect them. But in the media, the story tells completely different. So that in one hand, the company is actually com uh, committing lots of nice things, let's say net zero and EV and et cetera, et cetera. But in the media, there are lots of different stories. For example, in the UK, they, so the media, this is a media report. The media depicts that the company threatened to uh, pull out the, the, from UK if the UK government continues to put pressure uh, on the company or cancel, let's say, housing, <coughs> for example. So that, uh, that happens in, uh, let's say, UK and Mexico, in India, and et cetera, et cetera. So two stories, are, it, it, it wouldn't, it, 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 it's a two different story. So that our ask was, which one is right? Which one is right? Are you committed or are you not committed? So if you are committed, the media sends a different signal. So why don't you actually increase or disclose much, uh, much more so that we can actually have a one single story rather than two different stories? So um, I think to sum it up, what we try to do is basically since we are a bit uh, freer than commercial organization, try to push the boundary as much as possible where the law says you can do it. <laughs> then we, we just try to do it so that other asset managers actually can try much more. So that, uh, that is our engagement story. So GPIF outsourced everything, uh, a, 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 B, a, B, B. <laughs> no, the fund, the pension fund does not outsource every, anything because they have their own asset manager uh, and NPS uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, Norges, of course, also don't outsource and I think CalPERS don't outsource uh, either. So this is an important feature uh, and I think we kind of heard what kind of difference that makes uh, already in the kind of action or non-action you can take. So uh, let me pick up on the, so I'll ask one question and then I'll open it up to the floor. So let me just pick up on the last point about Toyota. Uh, so um, Japan, uh, Korea, and the Netherlands have of course signed net zero pledges. Many companies have net zero pledges. Um, so in um, uh, for GPIF, let me start with GPIF. Um, are you a member of, uh, what are the implications from that Net Zero Pledge? Are you a member of a Net Zero Alliance? Uh, and what are the implications of Net Zero for your stewardship program? And then I'll ask NPS and 
and give about the same uh, question. Uh, GPL is not a member of any net zero alliance like G funds. So why, what, one might wonder why GPIF, one of the Japanese um, government agency is, agencies, is not committed to net zero when the Japanese government is committed to it. Um, as, I said, as I explained in today's presentation, that we are not allowed to consider issues except for those that benefit our beneficiaries. So even if it is a national goal, the Japanese government's goal, laws and regulations around GPIF um, legal, legally prohibits um, setting a goal other than uh, benefiting our beneficiaries. <laughs> However, um, GPIF recognizes that climate change is not only a matter of political intent, but an important issue that will have a significant impact on investments. So um, that is why uh, we have been disclosing information in line with TCFD recommendations and have um, adopted the S&P Carbon Efficient Index that considers um, carbon uh, disclosures. At present, we do not think our activities are sufficient, so uh, we are actively uh, con considering to integrate more into climate change risk and opportunities. Regarding the uh, net zero, uh, NPS is not a member of any uh, net zero uh, movement, uh, especially the Glasgow uh, net zero alliances. Mm, but nonetheless, as I mentioned, uh, the list of the focus areas, uh, climate risk issue is one of the focus areas of NPS. So uh, we are not totally unaware of the consequences of the uh, climate risk. Uh, but, um, but since NPS is such a uh, wide and, uh, uh, and, and enormous influence on the equity market and on the companies, uh, the, the issue of uh, net zero, which is somewhat very critically uh, related to our industrial uh, energy structure, uh, because Korea has one of the highest concentration of carbon uh, in terms of energy output. It's one of the highest in the world. Uh, so it, uh, it's, it's related to the national agenda. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it's, NPS is very somewhat uh, careful, uh, somewhat conservative on that issue, but nonetheless, uh, we have to consider uh, the, the effects of other uh, uh, pension funds from, uh, from overseas, uh, bringing that agenda into domestic career companies. And in that case, what would be the position of NPS on the state agenda issue? So we do have to have an internal uh, principle of regarding on how to uh, tackle the issue of uh, net zero. But at this moment, uh, we are um, watching it very carefully, and uh, we are modeling on, on that issue. Uh, we joined uh, net zero 20 by 20 50, and then we are we have been quite a lot, uh, working quite a lot since 2015 or something, 15 or something, so that we measured where possible, so that, uh, I mean, it sounds very easy, right? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's not easy. So the equity is relatively easy. So that you can actually um, calculate and then based on the percentage, we can, okay, we, we have this much carbon uh, footprint. Fixed income, we just finished. So that the reason I'm saying the, uh, we, the, the measurement is you need to measure so that we can actually have a target. And then in the end, we meet uh, net zero by 2050. So fixed income, we've done it. Private equity, almost done. Infrastructure, not that easy, but then we are actually, we are, we are almost there. So then one by one, we are doing it. Um, so I think in a nutshell, by 2030, about 40% cut. Uh, in terms of uh, carbon footprint, by 2050 we have to cut by you know by zero. There is no way that we, we don't meet net zero net zero issues. Now, the problem is you know as as Mr. Lee mentioned, each country that has a different kind of um, energy structure and power power market structure etc cetera, etc. Cetera, so that those are very big time you know big time challenge so that what we do is we are actually working together with let's say policy makers putting pressure on the, the companies so that the companies can actually put pressure on the company and then sometimes we write to the to the president of a, a certain country <laughs> and, and and then I actually try to work with let's say ministry of energy and etc cetera, etc cetera. So that we are trying to do almost everything, but it's not that easy. Now, one thing I want to say is that at the, now when we talk with the companies, discussion is completely different. So then let's say talking to big, you know, group companies in Korea, for example, we're scratching our heads. How do we actually overcome this, you know, the techno, uh, technological breakthrough and etc. etc. Et should we buy an end? No, should we buy a one company was saying that should we buy an island so that we actually put, you know, plant the trees and then around that we put, let's say, some wind farm and then how do we, how do we make it possible from a grid and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So discussion is very different now. It used to be commitment. Now it's how. So and then that discussion is much more practical and nice. Yeah. That was a very encouraging uh, word. Uh, so. Um, we're almost out of time, but I think we have room for, you know, a few more questions. So, um, Pedro. Oh, sorry. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks for the panel. Uh, the first one, I have two questions. The first one is uh, for IK Park. Number five was the biggest one I saw on your list. And that was the Samsung child situation that led to the, you know, the scandal around NPS, which led to the jailing also also of the president here and uh, the Lee family in Samsung. And you said number five. You did. You didn't talk much about it, but that was the, the one top of mind. Coming to Korea, I wanted to to learn about your experience from that. Uh, and also, you said you left it as ongoing. That's the only one that has the beginning, but has no end. So I wanted to hear about that. And number two is more for N NPS now, uh, after the reforms and maybe for GPIF as well, is the dom domestic bias. As you become so big in your local markets, um, you know, you are crowding out others, but you also, you know, you. Going back to the first part of my question, you introduced this problem of uh, you know how so to to all three how how does APG work with NPS? How does NPS think about its optimal size and you know uh, diversify out of Korea? Yeah, um, it's ongoing. So I, I don't know if you guys already know this Samsung um, the chair. Some of the CNT and general industry. Um, the reason I said ongoing is that the court case is still ongoing. And two months ago, I was called in by prosecutor's office to testi testimony, testimony. So that the big, the biggest court, and then I was sitting in the middle as a as a witness, 
And then the other, there were six prosecutors asking me a question, and then that, that was quite tricky. The other part, part was Mr. Lee, and then the whole, whole about 15 uh, top management then, uh, who are in, they are all in and out of uh, jail. <laughs> they were there. <laughs> and then, so yeah, so the, the ongoing, because the court case is there, um, the one thing I want to say is that what did I get from out of it? I think Samsung Group is not going to make the same mistake. That, that's for sure. So I think that is good enough. Um, as a company, a PG, um, we just took, you know, this kind of risk, um, media exposure risk, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that even if the companies are very influential and big and etc., someone has to say no when no has to be said. So that um, otherwise, big companies would never actually never be afraid, and then we'll continue to do, do what they want to do. Um, so that's, yeah, that's part of the engagement, and I, I've done this, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, NTS has a, a, a strategy, a long-term asset allocation strategy to go abroad. Uh, as you mentioned, that there's some bias, and also uh, it is a problem of, of being a whale in a pond, okay? So, uh, that actually, uh, in a way, uh, constraints uh, uh, active uh, uh, engagement with the company. It's, maybe I can call it, it uh, too, too big to succeed. <laughs> it's not too, too big to fail, but it's too big to succeed. Uh, because when an NPS makes an announcement or makes a move or disclose that it's engaged in a, in a, in a, with a company and, and it's deciding on uh, the direct direction of the vote, it has so much uh, implications towards the market that uh, you know uh, NPS itself makes it sometimes difficult to actually be, be aggressive in, in certain areas. Uh, and it's it's uh, as you mentioned. So there's a long term. Uh, strategy, asset allocation strategies to increase the share of the uh, global assets. So we have, uh, we are paying our bonus of fisheries in yen. So we have to hold a amount of uh, yen for our holdings. So with that in mind, um, we 100% outsource our investment investments. So with with that, uh, we think that the uh, risk of uh, concentrating in domestic uh, equities or domestic bonds is uh, diversified. By selecting external managers that manages for us, uh, we are de-risking, or how to say, uh, we are not uh, get uh, being too gentle on the Japanese companies to ask uh, uh, by this um, system. Okay, you have the hand up for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, I learned a lot from the three, you know, the national, uh, national pension funds. And I'm very interested in the, the public pension funds. And uh, my question is uh, the, uh, going to uh, GPIF. Uh, the, the government and the GPIF might have political influence uh, and uh, political incentive uh, since the GPIF has a large amount of assets under management. I'm curious about the, not only the government's influence 
on the individual private companies, but also macroeconomic issue of government influence, such as a political business cycle. Uh, even if the, the GPIF outsourced, outsourced the investment decisions, the GPIF might have influence on the investment decision. Then, in theory, if the, the government has a lot of discretion in terms of investment, the government has an incentive to prop up the stock market by pouring GPIF money into the capital market if the, 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 uh, their political situation is uh, weak. Uh, then the, how can you make your governance structure independent from the Ministry of Health and the Labor or eventually the government? That's my first question. The second... No, no, we only have time. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, I think, let me try to rephrase this. Okay, so I think the question is, who decides on your asset allocation? How much discretion do you have on the asset allocation? Or, you know, is that, you know, how often can that change and how quickly? Which is also goes back to Pedro's question, I think. By the way, I've read all your annual reports. I know the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, the decision on our asset allocation, uh, we can our board decides on our asset allocation, and it's divided into four, uh, four uh, 25, 25, 25 percent into um, domestic equities and bonds, uh, foreign equities and foreign bonds. And it's changed a lot over time. I mean, it used to be all Japanese bonds, so it's really diverse, diverse by So, another? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I have one question to uh, Ms. Park. Uh, so, uh, I felt that there's some kind of a uh, difference between stance of Japanese CPIF and uh, Netherlands uh, APG. So Japan has this, uh, as Mr. Shiomura mentioned, this kind of sole interest policy. So even if they are very, uh, even though they are very keen on uh, promoting like ESG engagement and especially climate change, uh, the idea is that this is important for the long-term interest of uh, Japanese uh, beneficiary. But uh, so I, I just wonder what is your position on this? Whether you follow the sole interest policy? Um, because um, well, I understand that climate change is very important for Netherlands people. You are, you know, you're a very low country. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, uh, but, like, you know, but workplace safety in Korea, how does it relate to uh, you know, the interest of Netherlands beneficiaries? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think maybe your question is about fiduciary duty. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So fiduciary duty, I, I think we have, uh, uh, we, our definition is actually very broad. Unless a decision about ESG makes loss, we will just do it. As, uh, so that as long as you know our ESG work is actually leading to loss making, we will continue continue to push uh, ESG ESG matters. The reason is actually the contract between us and the pensioners. By the way, uh, majority of the pensioners are professors like you. Would you pay <laughs> Would you pay money to us? <laughs> Anyway, so uh, it's an 80 year contract on, you know, on, on average. So the people work, uh, people, no, professors work 40 years, and then after retirement for 40 years, they have to leave. In 40 years time, for example, the world has to be similar than, than uh, you know, as it is now. Otherwise, our pension money, the, the pension money that they will get in a very unsustainable world, what's, what's the, what is the point? So that we need to actually pay much more attention how to make the world sustainable as it is now. So that, that is part of our mandate. But when sometimes, so let's say tobacco industry, for example, it's a really <coughs> lucrative cash generative industry, but we let go, and then we just have to find the very good, uh, you know, the, the return making sources. That's all. Yeah. So I fear uh, we are out of time. Uh, so let me just uh, thank uh, the panel. I think uh, our discussion showed that uh, we have a real demand for learning more about um, the asset owners. Uh, and this was just the beginning of a long discussion. And I think the panel highlighted that there are many issues uh, that we wish to discuss uh, also in the future. Now, um, tomorrow, uh, I think we now have dinner. So you have the opportunity to speak uh, privately or individually to our panelists. 
Uh, and then, of course, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Gipana, who is going to tell you more about GPIF's Win Index experiment and whether it's been a good idea or whether it's been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, see you uh, at dinner. And uh, thank you again uh, to the organizers and, of course, to Suzanne and Elaine um, for a brilliant first day. Thank you very much.